When I was younger, I hosted a show on uh, TV in Australia about youth culture. And essentially, um, we would go out and make a short segment about something that was going on among teens. And I guess, I guess in that way, I sort of learned to produce short form video content. Uh, each piece is in, its, in a way is like a, a segment from a TV show. Hello, welcome to the Troll Museum. My name is St. Reverend Jen, come on in. A culture maker is someone who, for whatever reason, doesn't seem to fit into the real world and they end up making their own little bubble, their own little world, which um, slowly, if it catches on, becomes culture. There's kind of what you could call the uptown culture makers who have already made it and maybe they're even rich off of their creativity, their art. And then there are the downtown culture makers who are still hungry. When I was working on TV, I interviewed hundreds of people. Everybody from pop stars to, I don't know, four-year-olds. And um, I also come from a family of counselors. Oddly enough, my sister and my mother have both worked in counseling. And I think that's given me, both, both of those things have given me a good background as far as really being able to kind of put people at ease. If you can bring some empathy to what you're doing when you're interviewing people, you'll be much more successful in terms of what you get from them. Essentially, it was, uh, the rule was you'd ring a recruiter, because that's what they did. And you, they would, uh, that you'd give them the specs for the people you're looking for, and they would, uh, go through what in many cases was a database of liars who wanted a hundred dollars and they would basically sort of send you a grid saying we've got this person, this person, this person. You'd never see them, meet them, know anything about them and they'd just turn up on the day and you'd just keep your fingers crossed. Um, basically we, we've ended up going the opposite way. We reach out into our, our, our social group and our network of people that we have contact with um, through the company, who've worked with us before or who are um, luminaries in various fields because we do a lot of expert interviews. And we just go, we, we try to keep it real. We try to get people who are genuinely, uh, who, well depending on the specs, who genuinely know about a brand, genuinely care about a brand or genuinely hate the brand or whatever it is that will pull those people in and it's almost like more of a casting than it is like a recruitment. Um, it's really interesting now because you're seeing this blurring of, of research and content and it's happening for a great many reasons and a couple of them are uh, the democratization of technology and the fact that you know anybody can make a film now uh, that we are getting used to seeing film that isn't necessarily as uh, fake looking or artificial or perfect as what we were used to before. The way we assess it is not that it looks like it has uh, lesser production values, we assess it as looking more real, as looking more believable, as being more authentic. And I think that you know you see people uh, reaching for the things that feel real. So you see like even a, an agency like Crispin uh, making ads where you know the, it's, it looks basically like research. The, the stuff they did for Coke with the, uh, the lawyers being tricked and then there was the burger freak out, the whopper freak out and more recently the, the Microsoft stuff. It's sort of holding up a mirror to the consumer um, and it's a different consumer than it was years ago again where they, the consumer welcomes what feels real rather, rather than thinking that high production values speak to being better, they, it's almost the opposite is true. Thank you.